This is a sermon by Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida at St. Elizabeth's Church, Sebastian, Florida, July 28, 2013. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you that when we come here in your presence, we are welcome. You are the one who receives us, who is so glad that we can be with you, that you can be with us, who draws us to yourself, open our hearts to you, works in us that which you desire. And so we praise you that we can be with you, that we can draw near to you, that we can be with each other. Oh Lord, speak the things that you desire to say to us this morning. Work them deep within our hearts. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Have you ever had anybody stare at you when you walk down the street? That actually happens to me quite a lot. <laughs> And it has everything to do with the fact that I wear one of these. Uh, whether I'm, especially if I'm in a place where they wouldn't expect a clergy person, much less a bishop, to show up like the mall or something like that. It's sort of like, what's he doing here? And you know, I, I'm conscious of the fact that when people look at me and they see me in one of these, they have all kinds of funny ideas. Uh, that may or may not be true about me at all. Um, I could be this kind of kindly old man that they think about. Or I could be a pedophile. I could be a financial swindler. I, I could be a lazy person who couldn't make it in the real world, so I wound up getting ordained. I mean, <laughs> that all of these people have these ideas about what it means to, in essence, wear these clothes and be who I am. Thankfully, they're not true, but I want to say to you that I had that same sense when it became clear to me, and I was a college student, that it may be that I was supposed to go into the ordained ministry. My, my first thought was, oh God, you don't want me to be like one of them. <laughs> because truth be told, um, and I, I'm glad your rector is the exception, I would never met a priest I liked. <laughs> much less wanting to emulate <laughs> and so for me the leap of faith in saying yes to going to seminary had very little to do with well you know you don't make a lot of money if you're ordained or a lot of reasons that people give why it's really not such a good idea for me the leap of faith was God can I be who you're making me and still be ordained, I actually wasn't sure that was possible. And the unfortunate thing about it was, is that as I really began to get to know Christ as a college student, which is actually when it began to happen. Yeah, I, I went to church as a kid, but I found it really boring, to, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. And, I, and again, particularly if you had clergy you didn't like, well, did that cause you to want to get closer to God? Not at all. And, and in some ways, Jesus came to show us something very different from much of what we see even in religious leaders. That's a part of what he's trying to say in the Colossian lesson, where he says toward the end, he said, do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement, the worship of angels, dwelling on visions, puffed up without cause, by a human way of thinking, not holding fast to the head. In other words, they have these really funny ideas that, about what it means to be religious. But are they connected to Jesus? Not at all. That's what he means by puffed up by a human way of thinking, but not holding fast to the head. That's Christ, you see. And have you, I'm sure you've actually seen people like this on television, or you've, you've met them in churches, but not this one. <laughs> where you get this idea from the, from the leader that 
Um, you have to approach God in the way that he describes. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about self-abasement. I'm, I'm not worthy, oh God. Or the idea that somehow you have to have a certain kind of vision. You know, worse visions or angels and things like that. And if you really want to be a part of the charismatic in-group, then you've had experiences like we do. And if you're not, well, yeah, you may be Christian, but it's just not the same. And a way of, in essence, trying to create an in-group and an out-group. That's just not the gospel. And inevitably what happens is, people look at that kind of behavior and they say, well, if that's God, I want nothing to do with it. Inevitably. And I know that when people look at me funny, when I'm walking down the street and I'm one of these, they are probably people who have had that kind of bad experience, one way or the other. Church hasn't treated them right, or they've seen somebody that in one of these or a religious leader on a platform, and they go, oh, no. And unfortunately, that's actually the way a lot of people feel, especially if they have no contact with warm and caring fellowships like this one. Their picture of God is all wrong. Their view about what it means to be a Christian, if anything, it's a caricature. It, it's not the real thing. And they have this mistaken idea that if somehow they were to, in fact, get religious or be Christian, they have to become like one of them. And, oh, I don't want to do that. Because it does feel like a kind of inner betrayal. And, and it's a, a bridge they can't cross. And I want to say, I don't blame them. That's not what it means to be a follower of Christ. That's not what it means to be a Christian. But it has everything to do with having a picture of God and how we relate to God in a way that's different than what people assume out there. Or maybe perhaps some of the things that you've heard from religious leaders, of course, not your rector, <laughs> that, that really don't line up with what Jesus teaches at all. Because the wonderful, astonishing, life-changing thing about Jesus is, number one, he has come to show us who God really is. And that's one of Paul, again, one of the lines in the Colossian reading this morning. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In other words, the fullness of all that God is, is present in Christ Jesus, in bodily form on planet Earth. Which is why Jesus could say the most audacious things that got him into trouble with the Pharisees. Like, if you have seen me, you have seen who? The Father. Well, that's just blasphemy. Unless, of course, it's true. And see, that's a part of what we affirm even in the Creed. When we talk about Jesus being God from God, light from light, true God from true God, all of those phrases are ways to say that what we see in Jesus is really God and not something else. And see, the converse is true as well, that whatever picture you may have of God, if you don't see it in Jesus, you're wrong. You've got the wrong idea. And in fact, unfortunately, what happens to really many of us is that our picture of God is this kind of mixture of some of the things that we see in Jesus, some of the things that we've heard, ideas that we just picked up along the way and have no idea what they are, but it's, it's all in there. And so what happens to some of us is, in fact, when we talk about prayer, relating to God, we wind up feeling like we are relating to this picture that we have in our brain that actually may have almost nothing to do with what we see in Jesus. And so what happens is, for people like that, is prayer interesting? <laughs> no. Only if I get in trouble. Truth be told, when I think of prayer, it feels really boring. And yeah, if you're trying to relate to that picture in your brain that doesn't look like God, that would be pretty boring. You're talking to an imagination. You're actually talking to a deity of your own making that does not in any way look or act or respond like God. 
And so for you, if you're in that position, prayer is a frustrating experience. It's really not worth very much. Nothing really happens when you do it anyway. And besides, I, maybe I'm not worthy to get God's attention. After all, he's out there trying to do something about world peace. He doesn't care about what's really going on in me and my family. Or, you know, I've done really terrible things in my life. And if I actually pray, then what's going to happen is God's going to remind me of all those awful things that I don't even want to think about, some of which are probably still present inside of me, or maybe they really are, and that means I don't want to go to God at all. All of those are actually false pictures of who God is. Because, I mean, think about it with me. Do you see that in Jesus, any of it? No, not a bit. He's the one who turns water into wine to keep a party going. Does that fit into your idea about God? <laughs> He is the woman who said to the woman caught in adultery, your sins are forgiven, neither do I condemn you. Does that fit into your concept of God? You know, we have this idea somehow that, yeah, Jesus can be nice to other people. When it comes to me, man, I'm going to get it. <laughs> it's just flat out wrong. And it is those false pictures that we have in our brain of God that makes for us prayer a mystery at best. But in reality, only something I do if I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do. You know, after all, God helps those who help themselves. That's Benjamin Franklin. That's not in the Bible. <laughs> so you only pray but if you absolutely have to and have no, no place else to go. You see, all of that is just completely erroneous. Completely. And, and there, it may even be that what you need to do out of this morning is go back and look at the Gospels again and say, okay, who is Jesus real? And how do I see what he does? And how does that fit into my picture of God? If you can't see God making turning water into wine, if you can't see God forgiving the woman in adultery, if you can't see God having compassion on the hungry and feeding more than 5,000, you do not have an accurate picture of the God that we see in Jesus. And you won't pray. All of that is behind what happens in the Gospel reading when the disciples ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. You see, Jesus, and we see it all through the Scriptures, has this incredibly wonderful, intimate, personal, and powerful relationship with God. And it begins by how he tells us to address him. He said, okay, when you pray, say, Father. At this point, they're going, the disciples are going, no. <laughs> Quoting Ezekiel. He's the one who sits on the circle of the earth and beholds us as grasshoppers. <laughs> That's who God is. Father. Time, committed to us without reservation because we're his children. That's the last line. It's when Jesus tells this wonderful sort of outrageous sort of story. Look, if one of your kids comes to you and asks for bread, would you give them a stone? Their reaction would be, oh, of course not. Who, who would do that? If they ask for eggs, would you give them a scorpion? I'd never give one of my kids a scorpion. I mean, it's so ludicrous, it's actually kind of funny. And then Jesus sort of turns and says, well, look, if you being evil, because I know you've got sin like the rest of us, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, in other words, to treat them fairly and kindly, to love them and to support them and to never let them go, how much more are your heavenly Father Does that fit into your picture with God? So when Jesus begins this prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, he automatically sets us on a different footing than what some of us assume by using the word Father is the word that we use to approach God. Now, for some of us, that's an issue because we've had terrible fathers. And we need to ask God to show us what fatherhood really looks like. 
rather than what our experience of fatherhood has been. Whether some of us grew up with dads that were demanding and emotionally distant, where some of us grew up with dads who were negligent, for some of us who grew up with dads that were abusive, for some of us dads who left us, that happens a lot in the culture that we live in. And so when we think of addressing God as Father, what it does is that it kicks up all this ugly stuff that we weren't, wish weren't there. But he is the one who knows how to so change our hearts that he teaches us what, real, what it really means to call him Father. Meaning the one who is in fact tender, filled with great power, but clothed in gentleness. The one who can move mountains and yet notices that even the very hairs of your head are numbered and that a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without his notice. And who is powerful enough to forgive and to provide and yet relaxed enough to put up, I mean, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, when Abraham's in front of God, well, will you do it for 40? Will you do it for 30? I, I know I shouldn't be asking you this, but, but what about 20? That's actually a really very funny story. And what makes it humorous is, is that I have this sense that God's enjoying it. He already knows, because he's, that's who he is, he is a forgiver. That, of course, even for 10, but Abraham goes through all of these gesticulations. And, and I think God is kind of laughing. Well, of course. <laughs> sure. Yeah, ask again. It's okay. <laughs> because that's who he is. Because that's who we see in Jesus. Again, if your picture of God doesn't line up with what you see in Jesus, then you've got some mistaken notions about who God is. So we start, I think, by saying, God, I need to know who you really are. Not who I've conceived you to be. Not what I have imagined. But who you really are. And that's exactly what God delights in doing. He wants to reveal himself to us. Not just our picture of him so that we can enter into the kind of relationship with him that is bold enough to ask the very things that the Lord's Prayer gives us permission to ask. I mean, it's an astonishing list. We could do a whole day on it. But it's all predicated on the fact that you believe, and this is why you approach with boldness, a God who really is interested in you. He cares about all of who you are, materially as well as spiritually, which is why give us this day our daily bread. That means food on the table. Don't spiritualize it. It means making sure I have enough money to pay the bills. That he cares about all of who you are, spiritually, physically, all emotionally, and that he, in fact, wants you to come and talk to him about everything that's going on in your life, and that something happens in prayer that is nothing less than miraculous. Why? Because he cares about you. Now, see why that's so important? Because if you're over here, and, and you're talking to this picture of deity that looks nothing like God, I'm sure God's going, hey, who are you talking to over there? He's not going to give you much of anything. It's just, a, it's just an idea in your head. Turn around and talk to me. Maybe one of the reasons some of us so wrestle in prayer is that we're actually not talking to God at all. Ask God to show you who he really is. To open up your hearts to the one who literally turns water into wine. And come to know him and the joy and power of what flows out of a life that intimately knows him, knows that we are forgiven, knows that we are restored, that in him there is no condemnation, and fills us with the fire, I mean the fire of his presence, that fills us with purpose 
the grace, the courage, and profound strength to be who he calls us to be in the world in a way that results in nothing less than miraculous answers to prayer. Amen. Amen.